all over the United States and in many parts of the world, whether you're aware of it or not, there are people who are praying concerning our gathering here tonight. So this is not just a bunch of folks who've just gotten together. This is significant because God intends something very real to happen in our lives and to all of us in these days that we spend together. And my task tonight is going to be, with the help of God, to try to set forth what we are about, why we exist, who we are, and what we're supposed to be doing. Now I'm going to ask that you will call by the Spirit of God on your powers of concentration. One of the very difficult things in verbal communication is that the human ear can hear approximately 400 words a minute. That is, you have the ability to hear and receive 400 words a minute. I only have the ability to speak at approximately 150 words a minute, which means that my human voice will trail your human ear by about 250 words a minute. The human ear, in order to wait for the human voice to catch up, tends to move off onto other things and then come back to the speaker. In the process, when you get back, the speaker has moved on to something else. And you have missed something, and it's very easy to take something out of context and to draw the wrong conclusion. Therefore, it's important that by the Spirit of God that you ask Him to help you concentrate and to help you to hear at 150 words a minute instead of 400. Amen. We live in a time where almost everybody now agrees that Humpty Dumpty has fallen off the wall. What most people cannot agree on is how in all the world do we put Humpty Dumpty back together again. We live in a society where for a long time people felt that there were things within the world system that we could grab onto and have faith in. And especially in recent times, that faith has been shaken. I have never in my whole life been exposed and I come out of a background where in order to survive the kinds of jungle I grew up in, in order to survive you had to be a profuse liar. I mean you had to be good at it in order to survive. But as I have sat down in recent months and weeks and listened to certain hearings and watched certain hearings on television, I have never in my life heard such great lying. Come on. And, and the beautiful part about it is that I've never been exposed to people who have suffered from such great amnesia. You know, the, where, yes sir, did you pick up a suitcase? I think it was a suitcase, sir. Um, was there money in that suitcase? I don't know, sir. But I delivered to another person this suitcase that I think was money was in it, and I think the person who received it from me told me that there might have been money in it, but I can't be sure. And, sir, I picked up a message, and I was asked to deliver the message, but I never really understood the message, but I delivered a message to a person that I cannot recall who it was, and I told him the message that I didn't understand. <clears throat> and so, in the middle of that, the confidence of people has been shaken, and for a long time people were holding on to certain norms, and we now realize that the thing has collapsed beneath us. And people are saying, how do we put it together again? Where does the hope lie? Come on now. now, it seems to me that as we look at the world system today, we have three alternatives. 
Some people have suggested in looking at the messed up kind of world in which we live that one answer lies that we just go into the system, bomb it out, destroy it, and start all over again. And some people are saying that's the answer. Now the only problem that I have with that solution is that it presupposes that the world system is made up of facilities and that by destroying the facilities of the world system you can change the system. So some idiot says we got to get rid of General Motors. So he plants, plants a bomb under a GM plant, blows it sky high, says, ha we got GM. But you see, tomorrow morning, the executive committee of GM will meet. They will decide to build another plant at another location. They will double production facilities in the existing plants to make up for the loss of production in the one that was bombed. The insurance will cover the building of a new facility. And what the insurance does not cover can be written off of next year's income tax. So all you have done is inconvenienced General Motors. You have not done away with them. And that is the system. The system is not made up of facilities. You cannot change systems by dealing with its brick and mortar. Facilities are not systems. Systems are people. And if you want to change systems, you got to deal with folks. People. Now, now there, is, there is another solution that's offered. Now, you've got to keep in mind that the people who suggest that, that overthrowing the existing system and destroying it do have one legitimate concern. Their concern is that they do recognize that it needs to be changed. But there's another su solution that's suggested. The other one says that the best way to change the world system, to deal with this messed up society that we live in, is that we go inside the system and we change it from within. And there are many people who are saying, I'm going to go inside the system and change it from within. Now my only problem with that solution is that I have yet to meet one. I have yet to meet somebody who made up their mind to go inside the system and change it and who went in and did it. Because you see, the nature of the world system is that first to get change it, you've got to get inside of it. Then you have to work yourself up to a position of power and authority so you can affect change. And by the time you get in that position of authority, one has had to so prostitute themselves on the way up that when they get there, they forgot what they came there for. I remember when I was uh, in school, all the guys in the school who were planning on becoming ministers, you know, they were going to become pastors and clergymen and and they all used to sit down in what we call the hawk's nest at school and discuss how when they became leaders of the church, they were going to change the church. Guy says, when I get in the church, I'm going to make the church this and that and the other, and we're going to change it. And now as I travel across the country and the guys that I was in school with, these, these cats are now heads of their denominations and pastors and bishops and all that stuff, you know. And I said, hey, man, remember when we were in school, how we sat down and we talked about how we were going to change the church? Remember that? Yeah, yeah. But I, mean, you know, I said, you remember how we talked about uh, we were going to, uh, we're going to get inside the system and we're going to change it from within? How you doing? <laughs> the guy doesn't even remember the conversation. Whoa. Because you see, if you're going to change the world system, you better understand who controls it and who owns it, and in whose hands it lies. Now there is a third alternative. The third alternative says that people, in order to learn effectively, must learn by demonstration. They must learn with a model. You see, almost everything I know how to do that requires skill, I learn from watching somebody. I learned how to play football because a guy got down and showed me how to take a three-point stand, how to block, how to tackle, how to throw a pass. I learned how to play baseball because a guy showed me how to grip the bat, 
how to have a balance stand. I learned how to catch because a guy showed me. I learned how to play golf because a guy showed me how to keep my head down, keep my left arm stiff and all that. I learned how to play tennis because a guy showed me. Everything that requires skill, I learned because I had a model. Somebody became a model for me. Now you see, many of us who claim to be the followers of Jesus are suggesting that, that Jesus Christ provides an alternative, a solution to the world. And we keep saying the world is messed up and the world is messed up and the world needs to be changed. But we never give to the world the model of what it ought to be like. We never provide for them the example of the community. You remember on the day of Pentecost when Peter stood up and uh, the Spirit of God was working and, and so the critics came and asked Peter and the disciples, what's happening out here? They spoke drunk and Peter said, no, they're not drunk. It's the ninth out of day, it's too early, the bars aren't open yet, so they're not drunk. Well, what's going on? And so Peter said, remember what Joel the prophet said umpteen years ago? Yeah. Remember how he said in the last days he poured out his spirit upon all flesh? Uh-huh. You remember how he said your daughters and your sons will prophesy and see visions, etc.? Remember that? Yeah. They said, uh-huh. Peter said, well, this is that. There's the model. See, that there is. Well, what we've got to do, if we're going to say that the world needs to be changed, it needs to become something, some of us have got to get together and produce models of what it ought to be like. So that every time we go out into the world system and says, man, you guys are messed up, you guys are messed up, you've fallen off the wall, you don't have it together. When the world says, well, where is it? Where is it together? A group of us stand up and say, over here, this is that. And this is what God's talking about. And so that is the one I opt out for. I opt out for the fact that some of us will have to get together and be models of what the world community is supposed to be like. You got a beautiful takeoff on that when you read the 11th chapter of Luke. Now you remember in that chapter, uh, the disciples had come to Jesus because Jesus had just finished praying and they really dug on his prayer. And so the disciples said, hey Lord, how come you don't teach us to pray the way John taught his disciples? And it's very interesting that if you check out the New Testament, that that is the only time the disciples ever asked Jesus to teach them anything. Lord, teach us how to pray. Because they had observed that Jesus prayed as naturally as he breathed. In other words, prayer was not something Jesus had to strain to do. Prayer was not a side effect in his life. Jesus prayed like he breathed. It was a natural, normal movement of his life. Jesus didn't have to say, uh-oh, time for my quiet time. <laughs> See? <clears throat> he prayed naturally. And the disciples dug that. They, they dug that, that, that Jesus had this kind of rapport with his father that was no strain, it was no sweat, it was no effort. It just came very naturally, natural, normal conversation. And so they were saying, Lord, why don't you hip us to that? Get us in on that. Tell us how we can get in on that. And Jesus laid down the principles for the new community in the prayer he taught them. He said, when you pray, here's what I want you to lay on the father. You say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth the way it is in heaven. Now you see, right away that's mind-blowing because a great number of people have the idea that the kingdom is something that's way off there. And that we kind of get together and celebrate and praise Jesus a little bit and experience a few Christian Boost goose pimples and have a few thrills about Jesus, but ultimately we're all waiting to get over there. That is not, that is not what the scripture teaches. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth the way it is in heaven. In other words, it is the will of God to produce on earth a community of people who are doing precisely what is happening in heaven so that 
so that any time, any time anybody wants to know what is going on in heaven, all they have to do is check with us. Now that is what we're about. Now what is he talking about? Your will be done on earth the way it is in heaven. What's happening in heaven? Because you see, if you're going to do on earth what's happening in heaven, it presupposes that you have checked out what's happening in heaven. Now one thing is clear. In heaven, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is in charge. Now what Jesus is saying is that in heaven, he is in charge. That everything is under his ownership. That all of creation in heaven bows down to him, acknowledges him as Lord. He is in command. In heaven, God is having his way. That is not what is happening on earth. Now, it is, if you're going to understand what it means to be the new community, you've got to dig who controls the earth. Now, you see, some of the songs we sing are not scripturally correct. Songs like, this is my father's world. That's not really true. That's not really true. The Bible says the whole world system lies in the hands of the evil one. The Bible says that Satan, the devil, is the god of this world. He is the prince of this world, and God has not yet removed him from that position. That is why the Bible says the kingdoms of this world shall become, they are not now, the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. But God has a strategy, and God's strategy is to produce on earth a group of people who will be a colony in the middle of Satan's world for the purpose, for the purpose of committing spiritual sabotage on His world in order to make it happen. Now that's the kingdom. Now you see, let's try to understand what a colony is like. Those of you who have studied history know that down through history there have been what we know as colonial powers. These were people who left, who spread out from their mother country into other undeveloped countries and produced colonies. The English were a great colonial power. Now when the Englishman went to Africa and he set up a colony in Africa, it did not take the Africans too long upon observing the Englishman's lifestyle in Africa to get some understanding of how Englishmen lived in England. So by watching the Englishman, the Africans soon learned that the Englishman ate certain food. By observing the Englishman, he learned that the Englishman uh, had a certain type of lifestyle. He watched the Englishman and he discovered that at 4.15 every afternoon, the Englishman stopped for tea and crumpets. He observed the Englishman and in recreation and he saw the Englishman running around in the field kicking a ball through a loop and he began to discover that the Englishman at home played soccer. He watched the Englishman stand up with a, what looked like a bat but very flat. He watched the guy stand off and bowl this ball towards what they called a wicket and tried to knock the wicket off without the batsman hitting the ball and he called it cricket. And the Africans soon learned that by watching the Englishman that in England he played cricket. It is the will of God that you and I as the colony of heaven on earth would so live out the lifestyle of Jesus Christ as God's men and God's women that the world will be able to observe us as a colony of believers and know what's happening in the mother country. In other words, we are to be the live models on earth of what is happening in heaven. Now, what does this community look like? 
How do you become part of this community? And who are they? And what do these people do? Because you see, it is very important that you and I understand that we don't come to Jesus just to be saved. And we don't come to Jesus just to praise God that we've been delivered from hell and given a passport to heaven. That we aren't saved just to run around and say, thank God I'm saved. That is not what it's about. That God is building a community. And that the purpose of attracting people to Christ is for the purpose of producing a Christ community called the kingdom. And this kingdom is to reflect on earth of what's happening in heaven. Now who are these people? How do you become part of this community? Well, if you're going to have a new community, it's logical that you've got to have new people. can't have a new community without new folks. Now, you see, the tragedy that's taking place in our society today is we keep trying to build new things without understanding that you can't have something new unless you have new people. And almost every program and system that the world creates and builds falls through because we do not have new folks. Now, the system wants you to believe that everything is all right. It's not really as bad as everybody say it is. The system is sound. I never forget, Attorney General Richardson just, had just been inducted as the new Attorney General behind all the scandal of Watergate. And in his acceptance speech of accepting the new position as Attorney General, he had to spend 10 minutes of the 12 minutes he spoke trying to reassure the American people that the system is sound, that everything is all right. It may be a little shaky in a few spots, he said, but it's fundamentally sound. Cheating and lying at the highest forms, but it's sound. People disappearing, but it's sound. Millions of dollars unaccounted for, but it's sound. And they want you to believe, the world system wants you to believe that there is hope in their system. Well then, if there is hope in the system, we don't need the kingdom. There's no need for Jesus. We can wipe him out. All we got to do is trust in America, or trust Russia, or trust some political system. But there's no hope in those systems. Because the system is not founded on new people. You hear people say, return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. <laughs> when out of the past came a haughty law and order, America was founded by God-fearing men. George Washington prayed at Valley Forge. Ben Franklin opened the first Congress in prayer. America is a God-fearing nation. Really? <laughs> Have you... <clears throat> Have you ever checked out what Ben Franklin and George Washington believed? I mean, like, did you know that they were deists? Did you know that none of them believed in the Bible as the word of God? None of them believed in the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus? Did you know that? Did you know that Ben Franklin was the guy who coined the phrase that variety is the spice of life and left enough illegitimate children in Paris to prove it? Did you know that? And see, what has happened is the system has hoodwinked you and I into believing that the system's dream and the vision of the kingdom are the same thing. So we stuck God's name into our money, in God we trust. And we stuck God's name in the salute to the flag, one nation under God. Where? And they've got us believing that the system and the kingdom are synonymous. But I don't know what Bible you're reading, my friend, but that's not what I read. The Bible tells me that at the coming of Jesus Christ, he is coming to smash all the systems of men and to establish his own thing. That means that when Jesus appears, communism is smashed, socialism is smashed, capitalism is smashed, Americanism is smashed, the Republicans, the Democrats, the Socialists, it's all going. Now you got some dudes in this country trying to make you believe 
Jesus Christ is the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. <laughs> that he's head of the Republican Party, chairman of the Democratic Party. Everybody's got you believing that Jesus is running this system. But the Bible tells us that the community Jesus is building is made up of new people. Now, Jesus tried to get that across in this rap session he had one evening with a dude by the name of Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus, Nicodemus came to Jesus and he started to rap something like this. He said, Master, we know that you are a teacher come from God. And he started off by saying, we know. He didn't say, I know. He said, we. Now, who's we? Well, you see, Nicodemus was a member of what was called the Sanhedrin Council, the highest religious council among Jews. To belong to that council, you had to be a sharp dude, intellectual, philosophic, schooled in the scriptures and the law, the prophets. And what Nicodemus was saying, Lord, we know that you're a teacher come from God because back at the Sanhedrin Council, we have discussed you. Your name has been on the agenda at numerous meetings. We have discussed you, we've talked about you, we've debated your theology, your philosophy, and all of us unanimously agree that you are a teacher come from God because nobody can pull the things off that you're pulling off except God be with him. And we know that. And we're convinced of that. Now, the logical question, the logical question, if they knew that Jesus was a teacher come from God, why were they giving him so much flack? Why were they fighting him? Well, here's what they were saying. Jesus, we, we got no problem with you. I mean, in fact, in fact, we dig what you're doing. Man, we think that the stuff you're teaching is heavy, heavy stuff, out of sight. And we groove, we groove on the miracles, man. Blind people seeing, dead people coming alive. Deaf people hearing, out of sight. In fact, we even did your welfare program. A couple of thousand folks feeding off a few loaves and fishes. I mean, that's bad. I mean, we, got, we got no argument with you. All we are saying is, all we are saying is, you're doing it outside the system. You're not a member of the council. <laughs> we haven't laid hands on you. And all we're asking is that you come and join us. I mean, become part of the movement. I mean, after all, we agree on certain things. We got a lot in common. You believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, you're a descendant of Abraham, and we're descendants of Abraham. You come from one of the 12 tribes of Israel, and we come from one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Don't you see? We got a lot in common. Now, where we disagree is just a matter of words, a matter of semantics, and we can always get together on words. I mean, we, we are out trying to change the world, and you're trying to change the world. I mean, you call it, we call it reformation, and you call it the kingdom, but it's all the same thing. Why don't we get together? And it was at that point that Jesus understood that Nicodemus and those guys didn't understand where he was coming from. It, it wasn't really clear what he was saying. And so, so Jesus says, Nick, I don't want to blow your mind, okay? And I, I don't want you to get uptight with this statement. It might be a little mind-blowing. But... Don't, don't climb a wall when I tell you this. But except you are reborn, you won't see the kingdom. Now, now, now again, Nicodemus missed it. Nick said, you mean, Lord, I'm supposed to like uh, make it back to my mother's ovule and start all over again? You see, and, and, and he didn't get the point. And when Jesus said that except the man is reborn, he won't see the kingdom, Jesus was not saying that you will not physically see heaven. 
you know, the gates of pearl and the streets of gold. That's what, that's not what he's talking about. When Jesus was talking about seeing, he was talking about comprehending. Seeing with another eye. And what Jesus was saying is that except you are reborn by the Spirit of God, you won't even understand. You won't dig. You won't be able to see the kingdom I'm talking about. You won't see it. You know, because he had already proven that. Here were these masters of Israel who had sat down for years and studied the prophets. And they had studied the Messiah. And they had read what the prophets said the Messiah would look like when he came. Where he would be born. How he would be born. The circumstances of his childhood. And the prophets had years ago predicted what the Messiah would look like when he appeared. And Nicodemus and those cats in the Sanhedrin council had studied that. They couldn't get through seminary without knowing it. And now the Messiah was pacing up back and forth before them and they didn't see him. Because they couldn't see. Now Jesus is saying the kingdom I'm building requires a whole new radical person. And in order to belong to this new community, you have to be reborn. Now you see, 30 years ago, I was born into a world that taught me a certain set of values. That world taught me that this is a world of survival of the fittest. Every man for himself. Get them before they get you. Do to them before they do it to you. And I was taught that the name of the game was to get ahead. The name of the game was to beat the other guy out. And so that's the world I began to live in. And I participated in all the violence that my environment dictated. Busting bottles across people's heads and running blades into people's bodies. And the violence and the bigotry and the hate of my life was what motivated me. And I was told that was the only way to survive. As I got older, they told me the name of the game was, to, was, to, was to, to get out there and to make it. Go to school to get a better education, to get a better job, to make more money so you can buy more things, retire comfortably, die and leave something. And that was the name of the game. So I went out and struggled, man. Belong to the right social circles. Buy a home in the right neighborhood. Couple of cars in the garage. At least a swimming pool or two. Make a trip to Europe at least once a year. Make the right investments. Get to know the right people. Marry the right girl in the right social circle. Belong to the right country club. Play golf with the right people. And then all of a sudden along comes Jesus. And he says, that ain't important. That's not where it's at. That's not what it's about. That I'm putting together a whole new community and this community is built on a whole different set of values. And that you will never be able to live out those values unless you are reborn. Now to be reborn simply means that I change from one value system to another. But I can't do that on my own. I've tried on my own and I can't. And so what Jesus says is that I want to do it for you. And you see, what made Jesus Christ so utterly unique was that he was the only man who ever lived who was both the truth about God and the truth about man. If you want to know what God is like, you've got to check Jesus out. If you want to know what man is supposed to be like, you've got to check Jesus out. He was the truth about God and the truth about man. And what Jesus was simply saying is that for the sake of the building of this new community, I am going to become the last Adam. Now, the last Adam is a takeoff on the first Adam. According to the scriptures, the first Adam clenched his fist in the face of God, said to God, get off my back because I choose to do my own thing. And that is what sin is. Sin is doing your own thing. See, a lot of us try to get hung up on the specifics of sin. You know, am I sinning if I dance? Am I sinning if I smoke? Am I sinning if I go to a nightclub? What about the movies? Uh, am I sinning if I do this? And see, we're getting off in the wrong direction. That you must start off that basically sin is having your own way. Sin is doing your thing instead of God's thing. Sin is, see, you could be a perfectly moral individual, but still be doing your own thing, running your own life, thinking your own thoughts, mapping your own strategy, setting your own objectives and goals. That is what sin is. And what God is saying is that I want to, in the kingdom, produce a colony of people who are having my way instead of theirs. And in order to do that, 
You have to have him living his way in you because you can't produce his way. The tragedy is that a lot of us are trying to be Christian. A lot of us are trying to do Jesus' thing in our own strength. We're trying through our own effort to live the Christian life. And it's impossible to live the Christian life. You can't live it. An example. If I gave you eight hours practice every day for the next ten years to be exactly like the person sitting next to you, could you pull it off? Eight hours every day for the next ten years to be exactly like the person sitting next to you. <laughs> Some of you are saying, God forbid. <laughs> well, you can't do it. Because you are two distinct human beings. There are no two people in the human race who are alike. Now, if you can't be like each other, how in all the world could you ever be like Jesus? How? You can't. But do you understand the good news of the gospel is that while you cannot be like Jesus, Jesus can be himself in you. And that's what it's about. And that all Jesus is asking for is the right to live his own life through the common clay of your humanity. So the word Christian is spelled C-H-R-I-S-T, Christ, I-A-N. Christ in you, living his own life through you, without any help or assistance from you. Because do you understand that Jesus Christ does not need your help to be Jesus Christ? I mean, can you dig it? He made heaven and earth without you. I mean, God became a man in Christ without your help. He arose again from the dead without your assistance. He ascended back to heaven without your help. Now, what makes you think he needs your help to run your life? What he needs from you is your availability. And as you simply say, Lord, I am available. I am sorry that I've been doing my own thing. I'm tired of doing my own thing. I quit. And I give to you the right to do your thing in me. I give up. That's when it starts. And then Jesus Christ has the right to begin to move into the common clay of your humanity and start living his life through you. You see, if you don't do it that way, what happens is you go around like some of these messed up religious folk called Christians. They carry around in their pockets a bunch of rules and regulations. I'm a Christian. Don't do this. Stay away from that. Don't touch that. Don't go near that. And for God's sake, don't look at that. <laughs> And you see, and you keep, you keep the rules nearby, and you go out and you hold yourself real tight. Somebody comes up and says, hey man, you look like a nut. I'm no nut. Don't you see that I'm being spiritual? I mean, don't you see the halo over my head? You're saying that because I'm anointed of God and you're not. And then all of a sudden, they feel themselves about ready to reach out and grab something. And they say, whoa, 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 hold it, wait, 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 don't, don't touch that. I got to check the rules to see if it's all right. Now, <laughs> stay there. Stay there, will you? Rule number three says I can't do it. Hey, 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 come back. Uh, don't, hey, look, I can't do it. And now, come on now. Hey, hey, look, now don't, I can't do it. Hey, look, man, look, I, I, look, all the folks are looking, man. The folk in church are watching. I can't. Now, come on. Where you? Hey, look, man, I'm trying to be a Christian. But this is the fourth time I've been to the altar. Now, come on. Will you please stop it now? Come on, dude. Will you please? Oh, no. Hey, hey, honestly, God, I'm trying. I really am. And don't you see you can wear yourself out like that? I mean, like, I'm tired already. Don't you see, that is, why, that is why God says, look man, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, the devil takes God's word and turns it back to front. The devil says, don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Don't do that. Stay away from that. Stop that. Don't think that. Don't look at that. Don't hear that. Don't watch that. And there might come the glorious day when you'll walk in the spirit. 
And so you go around trying to stop doing all those things. You see? And so somebody told you that in order to walk in the Spirit, you got to crucify yourself. And you got to crucify all them sins in your life, right? So you get out your axe, and over there you notice that you got a sin. You're very impatient. You blow your fuse. So you start crucifying your impatience. Boom. Come on, kill it. Kill it. Wear it out. Get, get that impatience. Get it. Beat it down. And, and about, after about 10 years, you conquer your impatience. And then you notice you have jealousy. Oh, wow. And you go, bang. You go bang it away. Bang it away. Beat that jealousy. Get it. Get it. Get it. Got it. Woo. And then you find out that you gossip. Oh. Woo. And you beat it. You see, and you keep trying to conquer them sins in your life in order to walk in the Spirit. And the devil says, you just come to know Jesus. The devil says, um, Christian, huh? Yeah, man, just gave my heart to the Lord. Really? What you doing for Jesus? Well, nothing. Get up and go do something for the Lord. Hey, that's right. I've been a Christian, man. I haven't done nothing for the Lord. I haven't shown the Lord how much I love him. So you go out, do something for Jesus. Bang! Flat on your face. The devil says, uh, what, what, what are you doing down there? The devil says, I thought you were a Christian. Now get up and go back and dedicate yourself to the Lord. So you go back and you dedicate yourself. Oh God, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, if you give me one more chance, I promise, Lord, I'll really come through for you this time. Lord, you give me another chance. Devil said, okay, that's enough praying. Now get up and do something. And so out you go to do something for Jesus, man. Bang! Devil says, hey, um, that's the second time. Now look, get up and go back and rededicate yourself. So you go back to rededicate yourself. Lord, I'm sorry. Oh, God. One more chance, Lord. I promise I'll come through for you this time, Jesus. The devil says, okay, get up and do something for the Lord. And out you go, bang! The devil says, man, I'm beginning to think there ain't no hope for you. I'm beginning to wonder if you were ever saved in the first place. Now what I want you to do is go back and re-rededicate yourself. And then you go back to re-re-rededicate. And then you go back to re-re-re-re-rededicate. And all the time he's hanging you up. And Jesus says, man, there's a simple way. Why don't you stop trying to be a Christian? Stop trying to overcome the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. Do you know what the greatest sin in all the world you can commit? Yeah, it's trying to be a Christian. Trying to do something in your own strength and energy that only Jesus can pull off. And we're always out there fighting, trying to be Christian. Fighting. That's why some of us go into so many ultra-spiritual things. We keep on adding a lot of frills because we think that's what we got to do to prove we're spiritual. So sometimes our hallelujahs are not really hallelujahs from the Spirit. They're hallelujahs because we've got to let everybody know. No, hallelujah. I walked from that tent... Well, I came from that place to that tent, okay? And that's about 200 yards. And in those 200 yards, I'm stopped by at least 25 people who feel led of the Lord to lay hands on me. Pray for me. Uh, Tom, I just feel the Spirit leading me right now to pray for you. Oh, Jesus, pray. Okay, that's okay now. Dig that. But I walk 10 more yards, and there's another guy that feels led. And another guy that feels led. And somewhere along the line... I'm getting the fact that either God wants a special anointing, man, or, or somebody's trying to prove something. And I soon get to the point where I start saying, hey, man, I, w then I notice other people watching, and so the guy figured that if they did that, that he better go lay hands on me because that proves his spiritual. Because if he don't feel led to lay hands, maybe he's missing something. And so he goes do it, and then he goes do it. And after a while, we start copying each other in the name of proving that we're just as spiritual as the next guy. When God says, why don't you just relax, man? Amen. You just relax. You don't have to prove nothing. When the Spirit of God gives you the urge to say hallelujah, say hallelujah. If it isn't there, be cool. 
But don't get pressed. Be yourself. And let God be himself in you. So that when Jesus is talking about being reborn, he's not talking about copying and he's not talking about impressing anyone with your spirituality. He's talking about simply letting Jesus be Jesus in you. You make yourself available. Amen. And then it will change the way you pray. Check this out. You find out that you don't have love, that somebody you don't really love. and you, So you pray, oh God, Please give me more love, Lord. Oh, God, more love, Jesus. Oh, gee. You know, and we got to wait, you know, to prove we're spiritual. We really stretch it out, man. Jesus. More love, Lord. Now, you ever pray that prayer? Lord, give me more love. You ever pray that prayer? Hmm? Yeah. That's a dumb prayer. Dig it. God is what? Love. And when you receive Christ, where is God? In, in you. Why are you praying for more love? love. I mean, if you have received Christ and Christ is in you, then all the fullness of the Godhead bodily is concentrated in your humanity. Why do you have to pray for more love? You got it. Oh, God. I have such a short fuse. Lord, I keep blowing my stack. Lord, I'm so... Lord, more patience. Oh, God. Please give me more patience. Please, Jesus. More patience. Ever pray that prayer? Yeah. Dumb prayer. <laughs> Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is patience. And if you've got the Spirit of God in you, what do you have in you? Patience? Why are you asking God for more patience? Oh God, I'm so weak. Oh Lord, I'm so cast down. Power, Lord. More power. Oh God, please give me more power. Pray that prayer. <laughs> Hebrews 1 says, Hebrews 1 says, God who in past spoke to us by the prophet says, in these last days spoken to us by his son Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. It's all in him. And do you understand that the Christ who upholds the whole world by his power, when you invite him to be Lord of your life, puts his power into your humanity? And that you are carrying around in the common clay of your humanity the power of the fullness of the Godhead? And you're getting down more power? And so the Christian life is not your effort to be like Jesus, but it's letting Jesus be himself in you. And you begin to take on his lifestyle. And so instead of getting down and praying for more this and more and that, your prayer goes like this. Lord, I thank you for the fact that you today are calling upon me to be patient. Lord, I don't have what it takes to be patient, but I thank you for the fact that you are patient. And Lord, I praise you that you are in me. Therefore, Lord, today I trust you to be my patience. Lord, I don't have what it takes to be what you want. I don't have the strength in myself. But I thank you for the fact that you are my strength and you are in me. So I thank you for the fact that today you are going to be my power. It takes all the pressure off you and puts it on him and he can take it. And so what you got is a community of new folks in whom Jesus is living out his life. Your humanity becomes the vehicle through which he expresses himself. Jesus Christ is justice, so you start practicing justice because he's in you. Jesus Christ is love, so you start practicing love because he's in you. Jesus Christ is mercy, and you become merciful because he's in you. And the Bible says in Thessalonians 5, 24, 
faithful is he who calls you who will also do it. For everything God calls you to do, he will turn around and do it in you as you make yourself available to him. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul again says, Greater is he that is in you that is in the world. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What else do you need? What else do you need? So we're a new community. But let's take a look at that word community now. There are three words in it. There's the word uh, com, C-O-M-M, -M, from which we get the word commitment. Which means that this community, a group of people who are committed to each other. It's got the word commune in it. C-O-M-M-U-N, from which we get the word communion. It means a group of people who are in communion with each other. Then it's got the word unity in it, U-N-I-T-Y, singleness of purpose. So this group called the kingdom of God on earth of what's happening in heaven, a group of people who are committed to each other, who are in communion with each other, and who are together. Now, Jesus gave us an example of what that looks like when he said, in the new community, there's a new set of rules I'm going to give you to play by. And that is that you love each other the way I love you. Now, how does he love us? He loves me the way I am. Now, since God loves me the way I am and God doesn't ask me to go through any changes in order to love me, then if I'm going to love you, I've got to love you the way you are. Amen. Hey, we keep saying to each other, yeah, man, I love you if you change. I love you, may be glad to love you. I read my Bible 50 hours a week. How many hours do you read yours? Only five? Well, when you get up to 50 like me, come see me. You know what? Last year, I passed out 50,000 tracks. How many did you pass out? Or... You know, when I got saved, when I received Jesus, man, I cried. I just broke down and I cried, man. When you received Jesus, what happened to you? Well, when I received Jesus, I laughed. You laughed? Can't have fellowship with me, man, because I belong to the fellowship of the criers. Shoot. So the criers go in one corner and the laughers go in the other one. And we don't fellowship with each other. I love Jesus, man. And I'm charismatic. Are you charismatic? If you ain't charismatic, you can't belong to my fellowship. I got seven of the nine gifts. How many you got? If you don't have my gifts, you can't belong to my fellowship. And so we start dividing ourselves. And we divide between the criers and the laughers. We cry between those who roll and those who praise. We cry between the charismatic. We divide between the charismatic and the non-charismatic. And we divide and we divide. And I want you to know that the Spirit of God is not a spirit of divisiveness. He does not divide his own body. Now you see, to be in fellowship with each other is to be committed to each other so that we accept each other the way we are. And I don't impose my spirituality on you and I will resist you imposing yours on me. And you will have to love me the way I am and I will love you the way you are. Because you remember the body of Jesus, you've committed yourself to Jesus. And whatever Jesus wants to do in you is his business. And I will recognize the fact that you are under construction and I am under construction and we will grow together. 
But we don't play those kind of games with each other. Now, you, you, you got to break it down. You got to understand if you're talking about being a community, you're talking about a fellowship of people who are committed to each other, who love each other the way they are. One group says, uh, I'll love you if you were qualified. When you qualify yourself, I love you. Well, man, I ain't got nothing against you living in my neighborhood if you keep up your property. Be glad to love you if you kept your property values up. Well, man, yeah, I believe in being Christian and loving and all of that, man, but uh, as long as you promise to stay away from my sister, I love you. Be glad to love you, provided. And we keep putting stipulations and rules and stipulations. And Jesus says, so guy says, guy says, man, I believe that we should get together and love one another and have communion and fellowship and all that. But shouldn't we draw the line somewhere? Isn't there somewhere you draw the line? And the answer is yes. There is somewhere you draw the line. And listen to how Jesus put it. Greater love hath no man than this, that one person lay down his life for another. That's where you draw the line, at death. In other words, to belong to this fellowship called the community of God, we are to lay our lives down for each other. And you cannot belong to this community. You cannot call yourself the community of God if you're not prepared to die for each other. Now you see, it's easy, it's very easy to get together and have spiritual goose pimples together. Very easy to get together and put our arms around each other, you know, and go, pray, we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. When we pray that our unity, Jesus says, then die. May one day be one. Because it's easy to go through the swing and to put our arms around each other here. But are we prepared to lay our lives down for each other? Are we prepared to say, brother, sister, because you are a member of the community of God, my life is yours. You see, the problem is we want Jesus and we want to praise Jesus and we want to thrill to Jesus as long as it doesn't cost anything. We want to celebrate Jesus, but we don't want to die. And you can't have a family unless that family is prepared to lay each other, lives down for each other. Now to show you how messed up the world is, Jesus is talking about dying and we're running around. Jesus is saying, lay down your lives for each other. And we're going around saying, you know, we ought to tolerate one another. Jesus is talking about dying and we're talking about toleration. Jesus talking about dying, and we say, you know, we should accept one another. Jesus talking about dying, and we talking about acceptance. Jesus talking about dying, and folk running around talking about to bus or not to bus. That is the question. Jesus talking about dying. Don't you see how messed up the system is as opposed to the way the kingdom operates? And don't you understand that if you're going to belong to the kingdom, you've got to operate out of the kingdom's values? And the kingdom says that God's putting together a family of people whose relationship with each other is thicker than blood brother and sister. Amen. You prepared for that? You prepared for that kind of community? A community of people who hold each other accountable? A community of believers who are living in fellowship with each other and they know what the other person is doing. There's a book that was written called the Valachi Papers. It's about a guy who worked for the crime syndicate for 30 years and finally turned state's evidence. And he describes the story of Gino, uh, Vito Genovese, one of the uh, criminal lords in New York City who had gone to Italy for 10 years to escape deportation, came back 10 years later and all of his lieutenants met him at the pier when he got off the boat. And he walked over and shook their hands, shook and says, good to see you, Geno, glad you're back. Geno says, okay, John, he says, how's it going? John, what are you doing? John says, well, boss, I, 
I got a couple of restaurants. I own a couple of horses. I own the whole east side of Brooklyn. Gino said, good. Then he got over the next guy. He says, Bob, how you doing? Bob said, well, boss, I, I own five restaurants in Manhattan. We got the whole booze layout in lower Manhattan. We, I own this, this, this. Good. He got to the next guy, and he said, Ray, what's John doing? Ray said, well, boss, I don't know. The SS guy, what's this guy doing? Everybody was into their own thing, but nobody knew what the other one was doing. And one of the problems we're having in the community today is everybody is on their individual Jesus trip. I'm into my own thing with Jesus, just me and Jesus. Well, what about the rest of the body? Well, God will look out for him, but just me and the Lord, me and Jesus. And what many of us don't understand is that, that you can get into this me and Jesus bag and you can become unbiblical because God is not building individuals. God's building a community. And much of it is based on this philosophy of rugged individualism we get from America. When I got off the boat from the old country, I didn't have a dime in my pocket. I had only one pair of shoes and both of them had holes in them. But I pulled myself up by the bootstrap. I am where I am today because I worked hard. I didn't ask anybody for anything. Nobody gave me a handout. I just climbed up all by myself. And now you're asking me to take some of my hard-earned money? Money that I went out and sweated for and worked hard for and spent 15 hours in the field a day making, and now you're asking me to give it away to the poor and to feed the hungry? And you're asking me to put shelter over the shelterless back? Let them go out and pull themselves up by the bootstraps like I did. That's a great philosophy if you want to survive in America, but it won't work in the kingdom. Yeah. It won't work in the kingdom. Some of us got together during the war, and we sent food and clothing and medical supplies to the Viet Cong for the wounded and the hungry, and we were told we were anarchists. We were told that we were committing acts of treason. We were told that we were un-American because we were sending food and clothing and medical supplies. They told us we were aiding and abetting the enemy. Well, I don't know if the Viet Cong were my enemy. I still don't know that today. But if they were, if they were the enemy, let me lay on you what Jesus said. If your enemy hungers, feed him. And then you start talking about being a community. A group of people who love each other and are prepared to die for each other. A group of people who when they say brother, they mean that. And when they say sister, they mean that. A group of people who long to be with each other. Who long the time they spend with each other. Of the community of God, a group of people who hold each other accountable. Who are looking after each other. Who know what the other one is doing. And you read in Acts chapter 4. Verse 23, it says that when, the, when these disciples had been threatened with their lives and when they were let go, they went back to their own company, the fellowship of believers. And the Bible says that when the Spirit of God was poured out on them, the Bible says the multitude of those that believed were one heart and one soul. And none of them said that that which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Don't tell me you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you're not sharing with your brothers and sisters. Don't tell me you've been baptized in the Spirit of God and you're not prepared to lay your life down for the fellowship. Don't tell me you've got the anointing of God on you and you put up your for sale sign and move out the neighborhood when somebody else moves in because you don't like the color of their skin. Don't tell me that the Spirit of God has fallen on you You're not prepared to lay your life down for the other brothers and sisters in the fellowship. Don't tell me you got the gift of healing and the gift of tongues and the gift of discernment. And you're moving your church out the neighborhood because the neighborhood's changed. 
Don't hand me that junk. That's garbage. Because though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I have not the love, the communion of God, I'm a sounding brass. I'm a lot of noise. Can I, let me lay something else on you about this community. This community is a witnessing community. We say one thing loud and clear. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Now, we say that verbally. We say that in our lifestyle. Everything about us says Christ is alive. And Paul says, if Jesus Christ is not risen from the dead, then our preaching is vain. And the word preach, as he uses it there, is from the word which means living. See, to preach was to live. See, a lot of us think preaching is all verbalized. We're going to go tell people about Jesus. We mean go verbalize it. And we don't ever show them with our lives. Paul says, if Christ is not risen from the dead, then our living is in vain. Because it's our living that will say that Christ is alive. Now the problem is, how do we say he's alive? Do we simply say that we've witnessed because we go and take some tracts and literature and we stuff it down people's throat and say, Jesus lives? Or the kind of people who come back with their sales slip today and they say this afternoon, 25 people prayed to receive Jesus. And they're almost like automobile salesmen, you know. They got to make so many, so many sales for Jesus today. And they get out, boy, and, and they grab people, you know. Do you know Jesus? Can I tell you about Jesus? You don't want to know about Jesus. Okay. You know about Jesus? You want me to tell you about Jesus? Well, you see, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, rose again to forgive you and to live in your heart. And if you pray and ask him to come right in your heart right now, he'll come in. Now, come on, just get down and pray. Now, right now, say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, come into my heart. Praise God. Woo! And then we come back at the end of the day and say, 25 came through for Jesus. Where are they? I don't know. They're back there somewhere, but they came through. Baby. You see, don't you understand that witnessing is not just verbalizing? That when the word of God talks about witness, it is talking about the community of God infiltrating Satan's world and proclaiming by our lifestyle that Jesus is alive. I want you to get that now. I want you to get that. I'm talking about your lifestyle. I'm not just talking about you learn how to preach with your mouth. Or you learn how to witness with your lips. Although you must be able to give an intelligent reason for the hope that is in you. Yes. But it also means that your life testifies that Jesus is alive. Don't you understand that if this is Satan's world, then our job is to infiltrate his world so that we can sabotage it by our witness. How many of you are still in high school here? Raise your hands. You're still in high school. Do you know why you're going to school? Yeah, I know. You're going to school to get an education because you need the diploma to go to college. But that's not why God's got you there. Because suppose you die the day you graduate from high school. You don't get to college. Then you wasted four years of high school. No, 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 I didn't mean, no, no, I didn't mean you drop out of high school not what I was saying. I was saying that that's not the reason that God's got you there. That high school is the world system that God has put you in to commit sabotage on. That's your mission field. That's the place that God has put you to live out the kingdom. And there ought to be a colony of you in the school, that school, who are committed to each other, who love each other to death, who are prepared to lay your lives down for each other, and you become a model in the school of what's happening in heaven. That's what it's about.
How many of you here in college? Do you know why you're in college? Yeah, to graduate so you can get a better job and make more money. Because the system has convinced you that those who graduate from college make $4,315 a year more than those who graduate from high school. But that's not why God's got you there. That college is your mission field. That's the place that God has put you to infiltrate and to build the kingdom of God, to build the colony of heaven. Some of you will play on the football team at college. That's the place God's put you to infiltrate. Some of you will be on the debate team because that's the place God's put you to commit sabotage. Some of you will be in the chemistry club, in the biology club, and some of you will belong to something else in the school, not just to say you belong to it, but that's the place God has put you to represent the kingdom. Yeah. Remember in World War II, the Germans practiced what was called sabotage or infiltration. They sent people behind the lines. And these people were Germans who spoke fluent German, I mean, spoke fluent French. They got French documents, French papers, French citizenship papers, and they got jobs in the French Republic. And what happened? They set up because the Germans told them that one day we're going to invade France and we want you to set up the invasion. So that when we invade France, we will have Germans in France who are ready through sabotage to help soften up the invasion. Do you understand, my brothers and sisters? There's an invasion coming. Do you understand? Jesus, Jesus is coming back to establish the kingdom. You and I are his fifth columnist. We are the advanced troops. We are the saboteurs who ought to be at work in the world system, setting up the invasion. Hey, look, I, I got to quit because... They, you're getting tired. Let me lay this on you. Let me lay this on you. Some of you, some of you who, who have athletic ability, and you may be feeling that God wants you to exercise that athletic ability, but you've got guilt feelings about it because you come out of religious backgrounds that place some kind of hang up on athletics. That may be your mission field. Because you see, we gotta have, we gotta have saboteurs on the New York Giants, the New York Knicks, the Washington Redskins, the Los Angeles Rams. We gotta have saboteurs. We gotta have fifth columnists. Some of you feel that God's calling you into business. You don't want to go into business just to collect stock options and just to say you're a wealthy businessman. Nah, that's not why you want to be a businessman. See, God needs some people to infiltrate the business world. See, we got to infiltrate IBM, General Motors, Standard Oil, New Jersey. We got to get inside and start building the colony of God at Boeing, Pan American, American Airlines. We got to start breaking our way in and start setting up the kingdom in those places so that some of you who must become business people who infiltrate the business world, you don't buy the system, but you infiltrate it. Name the game. And so that the body of believers can start sitting down and we start talking about our people at General Motors. Yes. <clears throat> we start talking about the community over at Boeing. We start talking about, we start talking about the fellowship in Congress. We start talking about the community of God in the White House. Now you see, you see, some of us, some of us were hoodwinked last year into believing that God was already there. I was, at, I was at the presidential prayer breakfast last February in Washington, D.C., and I sat at the table 
with one of the men who later became convicted as one of the Watergate conspirators. And you know what he told us at the table at the prayer, prayer breakfast? He said, God is moving in the White House as never before. And he was right. But you see, we need, we need men and women of God who will build a community of God in those places to become God's fifth columnist, to become God's saboteurs so that we can become the colony of people who make the kingdom of God happen so that the words of Jesus and the words of the scripture about Jesus become more and more true that the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and we start reporting to each other about how the infiltrating is going on So you see, when we meet here, when we meet here to praise Jesus, it's not just to praise Jesus, but some of us will be able to stand up on a platform and say, let me tell you how the sabotage work is going on at General Motors. And then we can say, praise the Lord. And we'll get some folk who will stand up on this platform and say, let me tell you how the sabotage work is going on at the White House. And we'll stand up, praise God. Then you got something to shout about. Then you got something to praise God about. Because the kingdom is prevailing. And so we infiltrate the world. Do you understand? If we had been fifth columnists in the world, a lot of the junk that's going on would not be occurring now. Do you believe that, do, would you believe that if we had a community of God working at General Motors, we wouldn't have such a hard time trying to convince GM to produce for us a pollution-free car if we had some community of believers in there? Do you believe that? Do you believe that if we had a community of believers in Congress, it wouldn't have taken them 350 years to, to confirm by legislation that all men are equal? If we had a community of believers there, would you believe that? Would you believe that if we had a community of believers in your church, it wouldn't be segregated? Would you believe that? Yeah, you want me to quit now. I quit with this. We are... We are a discipling community. Because you see, out of our witness, what's going to happen? Out of our witness, what's going to happen? Folk are going to come to Jesus, that's right. Out of our witness, people are going to say, Hey, brothers and sisters, what must I do to get in on this? How do I get into the community? But you see, when a person receives Christ, according to the scripture, he has just been born again. But you know what's happening? We're doing something like this. Junior has just been born, okay? And he's been brought home from the hospital and put in the bassinet on the kitchen table. And we say, welcome home, Junior. Glad you could make it. <laughs> now, Junior, behind you is the fridge. Meat, steak, fish, cold cuts, soft drinks, everything you need is in there. When you get hungry, climb in. <laughs> now, Junior, from time to time, you're going to need a diaper change. Now, we keep your diapers in the linen closet down the hall on the right. Anytime you need changing, just call on down and help yourself. <laughs> now, Junior, you're going to be doing a lot of sleeping these days. And your room is in the hall down the left. And we knew you'd be a boy it's decorated in blue. And you just go on and climb in bed anytime you feel like it. Now, we know that's absurd, right? Because Junior can't feed himself at five days of age. He can't clothe himself. He can't find his way to bed. That's why Junior's got to have parents who will feed him, nurse him. After they feed him, you know, you got to pick him up and burp him. And you got to take Junior and you got to change his diaper. And Junior has no respect for night or day in those early days. And you got to get up with him, 1 o'clock in the morning, 
Four o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, around the clock, you got to struggle with Junior. Junior gets a little bit older, you know, and he starts trying to sit up, and you got to sit him up, you know, and help him prop up so his back gets a little stronger. Then Junior starts crawling, man. Junior starts getting around and starts grabbing the things, so you got to move certain things out the way so Junior don't kill himself. <laughs> Junior bumps into the table, rolls down the stairs, and you go down and grab Junior, pick him up, call an ambulance, jump in the car, go to emergency ward, you get x-rays, you look after Junior, man. You care about Junior, you keep him under close tabs. And then Junior starts trying to walk, he stands up, and you help him stand up, and then the day comes when little Junior's legs start getting a little stronger, and so you step back and say, come on, Junior, come on. And Junior takes a step and he falls towards you, and you grab him. And you pick him up and you back up a little bit. And then Junior gets strong enough to take two and then he falls and you grab him. And sometimes, you know, Junior tries to walk when you're not around and he bruises his knee and you go off and get the eye down and you, and you put the, the band-aid on him. But you watch Junior and you develop him and you discipline him and you correct him and you love him and you give him affection and you feed him and you teach him. And you discipline him, and you give him affection, and you love him, and you correct him, and you discipline him. And Junior gets older and older, and then one day we take and we present Junior to the world as a man. How come we don't do that with new Christians? You know what's happening? Some of you came to Jesus Christ. You've been, you've been converted a year. You've known Jesus two years, a couple of months. And some of us were so elated, you know, and we wanted to get you in our program, you see. Because we, we Christians who've been around a little bit, we're very program oriented. And we got to find a way to get you in our program. So as soon as you were converted, the first thing we did, we told you, now that you are saved, you got to go out and win somebody else to Jesus. And you were still a baby. You had just come to know Christ. You hadn't gotten into the word of God yet. You didn't even fully understand what the Christian life was all about. But we stuck our literature in your hands. And we gave you a quick preparation course. And told you how to tell somebody else about Jesus. And we sent you out. And some of you can bear witness tonight that some of the brothers and sisters you know have been eaten up. Because they couldn't survive out there. Because they weren't nurtured and taught and fed. They were like babies let loose in a jungle. Now you see there's a lot of emphasis today on coming to Jesus. And I want to caution you on the other side. And the other side of the coin is you can spend so much time being excited about the fact that you're saved. And you can be so excited about the fact that you're going to heaven. And so grooving on Jesus because you, the, the Spirit of God is on you. That you don't spend time studying the constitution of the kingdom. And learning what God, don't you understand, God doesn't speak to you through spiritual frills. God speaks to you out of his word. And if you want to know what God's saying, you've got to study the word. Some of us want God to speak to us by osmosis. We're sitting down. We're sitting down just waiting for God to give us the word. Speak to me, Lord. Lord, give me a new vision. Lord, do a new thing. And God's saying, everything i got to say to you is in the word. And some of us, we want new visions and new voices from heaven. God has spoken in the Word. We sit down and say, oh God, I want to know your will. God says, my will is in the Word. But we don't want to study the Word and we still want to know what God's trying to say to us. And I want you to understand that there's a lot of things going on in the country today where many people are being one to Christ. Last summer we were in Dallas, Texas at what was called Expo 72. A hundred thousand people gathered in there to learn how to give away their faith. And God is going to honor that as thousands of people went across the country winning other people to Christ. But don't you understand that if we don't also turn loose a hundred thousand teachers to follow those evangelists, we're going to end up with a whole big maternity ward but no nurseries. Yeah. We're going to end up with the most retarded generation of Christians in the history of the church. We're just going to run around with people having spiritual goose pimples, praising Jesus, but not knowing what God's saying. Come on. Yeah. You can take it or leave it, but it's the truth anyhow. You see, because what happens is if you don't 
study the scriptures and you don't know the word of God, you will just end up on, you just be tripping out. You just be having the Jesus trip with no substance. Because don't you understand, God has married the Holy Spirit and the word of God together. You cannot have the word of God without the Holy Spirit. You cannot have the Holy Spirit without the word of God. If you try to have the word of God without the Holy Spirit, you will end up in cold, dead legalism, bound by the law. You will end up with all those rules and regulations. Don't, 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 don't. But if you try to have the Holy Spirit without the word of God, you'll just end up with emotionalism. It'll have no substance to it. God has married the Holy Spirit and the Word of God together. You can't deal with Satan. I hear a lot of kids today talking about demon possession. Everybody's into the demon possession thing. There is only one way to deal with the devil. It's the Word of God. No other way to deal with him. You remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? He was tempted three times by the devil. Every time he was tempted, what did Jesus say? He quoted the word of God. It is written. It is written. It is written. You can't deal with Satan if you don't know the scriptures. If you're not studying the word of God, you can't overcome his power. Some of us, we think we can cast out the devil with a whole lot of gibberish, you know. In the name of Jesus. But the name of Jesus is based on something. The word. Come on, get with it. You've got to get into the scriptures. Anything less than that is missing the boat. We are here to build the community of God. So that when you leave here, every last one of us will go back to wherever we live and wherever our mission field is, and we will begin to become part of a colony of people who will be a live model on earth of what's happening in heaven. That's what it's about.